Welcome to Influential Entrepreneurs, bringing you interviews with elite business leaders and experts, sharing tips and strategies for elevating your business to the next level. Here's your host, Mike Saunders. Hello and welcome to this episode of Influential Entrepreneurs. This is Mike Saunders, the Authority Positioning Coach. Today we have with us Jonathan Tuttle, who is an investor, speaker, upcoming author, and the founder of Revenue Ascend. Jonathan, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me on. I'm excited. Hey, you're welcome. Um, hey, I'm looking forward to talking with you. You've got a really multifaceted business that helps a lot of different uh, companies, and I want to learn more about what you do. But uh, give us a little bit of your background, and then uh, what led you now to found the company Revenue Ascend? Sure. Yeah, great question. Um, I started Revenue Ascend about four years ago, but it's been really fascinated by technology. I remember, I'm old enough to remember when Google first came out, and when it first came out, I was just really mind blowing. I knew it was going to change everything. Uh, this was 97, 98. I would go when I was first year freshman in college. And I spent all my time just in the library, just on the computers, the internet. And anybody's old enough to remember how he, how much different it is compared to today. <laughs> the dial yeah. up and you know, it just it's just fascinating to see how much has changed in the last 20 years. Specifically, I think the last five or ten is where it's we really like kind of crossed the chasm where it's just like you have to be. Your business has to have a digital presence. You have to be using these technologies. Otherwise, you're going to get left behind, as we're seeing with uh, all these retails and malls closing. They're predicting, I don't know, like one-third of the malls are going to close in the next five or ten years because it's all e-commerce and digital. So just being in the right space and able to help customers and actually small businesses is what really excites me. Um, and that's what really got me into it. I just noticed the trend about 20 years ago. started the agency four, uh, four years ago now. Uh, and then but in between that lull, uh, I was in college and I was working other jobs uh, and I just really just just started doing little by little, little by little more into the space. I did a few different charity boards for Chicago where I do like the social media and digital marketing, just, you know, just for fun, just to help out. And that's what really kind of got me started. And then I was like, might as well start an agency and see how I can help businesses. Yeah. Yeah. I really uh, like that because you, you tend to, you see a business that's already up and running and when you can make some tweaks and adjustments, then the momentum mm -hmm. is already going. Um, and nothing wrong with a pure startup, but a pure startup is like that train that's sitting at the station and you've got to get it, you know, sluggishly started from a dead stop. So um, do, what do you find when you first start working with a company? What is the most um, impactful thing that you're addressing first to help them move forward? Yeah, I agree with you 100%. Like we even, we even kind of have our clients kind of do like an old application to see if we're a good fit so we're not wasting each other's time. Uh, the if you have enough market presence and we first look and see digital, the best thing about digital is so scalable and so measurable. It's unlike other forms of advertising back in the, they said back in the eighties, like the attention span was 20 minutes. And now with smartphones and with so much media thrown at us, the average attention span is less than a goldfish. It's kind of common knowledge now, seven, yeah. eight seconds. And so we can also measure the impact of what digital does. And the first thing we like to do, we like to kind of see, uh, the structure of the business because a can they handle the influx of new business? Are they you know do they have systems and process in place? So we kind of encourage them to have some softwares, making sure specifically if it's a lead gen offer, making sure the person we record you know using like call rail or one of the full voice recordings, we could see actual who's answering the call and making sure there's not a drop off or there. And then we also put in systems with some of the softwares to make sure that there's text, SMS reminders, emails, you know. You know, if they don't open email, just follow up emails based on what, you know, the open rate, just to make sure that we get that lead from just finding about you to get into the, your, you know, your brick and mortar location. So that's one of the things we want to see. We want to make sure first that the systems and process are in play because, and then you can be, handle the extra business because if any of those are broken, we could send the business to you, but it's not going to really do, do you a favor, basically. Yeah, that's a really good point. It reminds me of a quote I remember hearing um, Jeffrey Gittimer wrote in, in a book a few mm -hmm. years ago, um, call, and, and the quote is, build capacity in advance of demand. So you need to know where you know your, your influx is going to come from, but if it comes in pretty good the way you plan, can you handle it, or are you going to implode, and then really you may as well not have had that increase because you're going to mess up your processes. The customer and the client that you deal with is not going to appreciate that, so I think that's such a really good um, fair uh, 
thing to do is to have that assessment up front. Yep, exactly. And that's a great, I love his books. The red, was it the little red book is selling and the green book? Yeah. <laughs> Jeffrey Gittimer. Yeah, those are great books for any uh, business or entrepreneur. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He's a, he's a great, great speaker, writer. Um, so now let's think about this. When you're mentioning some of these call tracking and text and follow-up, um, you know, let's, let's bring an old, another old saying in. I, I love quotes and sayings, but it reminds me of, you know, the fortune is in the follow-up. Yeah, we've heard that. Mm-hmm. And then follow-up until they buy or die. And that sounds really mercenary <laughs> to say, but you know what? It's like this. Too many, you've seen the stat before where it's like this percentage of people you know, only follow up once and this percentage only follow up twice and this percentage, yep. but then most of the sales come after the seven, eight, nine, tenth 10th follow up and people yep. are giving up after one or two. So how important is it for A, follow up, but B, then let's talk a little bit about how a company can make sure that they've got follow up in, uh, in their processes and then what you do when you're working with clients to help make sure that that happens just on autopilot. Yeah, you're 100% right. It is the fortunes in the follow-up. And that's one thing, even training the staff, like when I even bring on new people, I'm like, it's eight to 12 times. So each of these little small steps of follow-up, and we can obviously follow up with some retargeting and some emails and text, but also that personal one-on-one touch and tracking and seeing, measuring it and seeing what people resonate with. So we sometimes will do personal text, follow-up calls. We just tell them that every little, it's one little step closer to a yes. And then the actual people will believe you more, like we going back to what I said earlier, is people get so many, they're so, their attention span is so short, they get so many messages a day, you're going to stand out following up with power, following up with an offer that makes sense, but you're also demonstrating, this demonstration is the most powerful form of marketing and, and, you know, and, and getting people to, you know, jump over the edge to, you know, take on your service because you're demonstrating that you believe in it so much that you really want to do it for their best interest and showing that, hey, I'm trying to get you on it. I'm trying to get you in to our brick and mortar because that's how we believe in the product. So really, it demonstrates to people like, hey, they must really believe in it. And I think the people that don't follow up, you're kind of saying, hey, even when I'm signing up for different services or companies or partner, like if they don't believe in enough, if, you know, after one or two times, that means why would I want to do business with them? You know, yep. like, is this somebody that's going to be my best, you know, fiduciary? Are they going to help me out or they just don't really believe in it and it's like I'm not a good product or service? So, yeah, the 8 to 12 is depending on how expensive the product or service you have. I mean, it could be a low as five, but the lower would be if you have a bigger market brand awareness. But if you're just fresh or you're new or you have a new offer, it's going to take more. Um, and one of the ways to follow up, I think we have so many technologies now that make it measurable. So we that SMS, uh, things like Twilio, uh, there's so many different emails. They're all you know, marketing systems. They're all pretty similar. Active campaigns, pretty common. And the cool thing is it tracks. Like, yeah, we know that the open rates, you know, it's 5, 10, 20%, but it also depends on what you're sending in the message. So the headline, and not just spamming them, like, make sure there's something of value. You could put some testimonial, social proof, like, here's a video testimonial. If you have any questions, here's a review from somebody like you here's what they had to say. And not just like these, I mean, copywriters could have some really engaging headlines that get you to open them, but if it's just a really drawn out, non-value, long form email, those that we've noticed don't work as well unless you're selling like info products. So if you're a small so business, just really having some social proof and some offers in the follow-up. Um, you mentioned two things I want to really go deeper on because it's really interesting, but eight to 12 times. I've heard that for mm-hmm. decades. And I think that my opinion is, and let's see what you think of this, with all of the text and social media and bots and chats and all of these things that capture our attention today, I feel like it takes one or two or three times to count as that first time for the 8 to 12 because things are flying across our prospect an hour uh, so often that you're like, oh, yeah, whatever, and then delete. And you you don't really pay attention to it. So Mm -hmm. um, it's almost like tacking your business card to a telephone pole on the Autobahn and people are zipping by it 100. 90 miles an hour, they're not going to see your, you know, fine print offer. So I think that we need to keep that in mind when we're like, oh, we can follow up so much. Don't kid yourself. People are not calmly reading and internalizing your email or your tech. They're seeing it. And then the other piece is the long form. Um, you know, I, I'm a student of the, the marketing industry and I, I learned this and I'm sure you you know it as well, but I attribute it to Dean Jackson. I think that it's his baby, but the nine word email, and it's not really nine specific words. It's the concept of don't have 19 paragraphs and a header and a graphic and a call to action. Just go like, hey, 
Tom, what do you think about the blah, 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 whatever? And it feels like a conversation. And I can tell you when I see those kind of quick, you know, checking in or, or a quick little, you know, quick question kind of thing with one line or one question, those get responses so much more than the 14 paragraph one that we're thinking mm-hmm. that is telling our whole story. What are you, what are you seeing on the frequency of contact as well as the, you know, quick hit, maybe conversational style? Oh, I agree with you on both both fronts. Uh, and we've tested a lot of different emails and cold emails and the conversational short essay and question where it feels engaging, but it's just a general yes or no. It's hundred percent that gets people engaged because it, it just, it just does instead of having them being pitched. It's a great, uh, great way to get a, a response and have like an open end question. Those work really well. And like you said, the one to three, it's probably right. I mean, like we, we try to get four or five, like we always kind of encourage like four or five actual touches, depending, it all depends on the business. Cause we work in a couple of different businesses. Some businesses, the bigger, the more expensive the item, it's a longer sales process, unless you're really proving your marketplace. But if it's a lower ticket offer or something that's kind of like, well, it doesn't cost that much, you don't have to, you know, it's not going to take as many hits. So we have to kind of figure out what your product and service, if you have a few thousand dollar item, it's going to take more follow up. If it's a couple hundred bucks or 50 bucks, you could follow up less and you could probably do it more casually if it's kind of a no brainer offer or something that actually adds value and doesn't, you know, you know, they throw in a credit card and they won't even have to think about it. Um, yeah, and exactly. Just measure. The key is measuring. What's easy about technology is you can measure and see the, all, you know, always check over the shoulder. You can see in real time what the response is, especially the text or email. If they respond back, you can see whether it comes in and just holding your, your staff accountable. Because that's the, usually the biggest drop off is like the front desk. Because a lot of people don't care. Yeah. The turnover is pretty high. Because you could have the best service. Like if you're, you do HVAC, or they have the best servicers. Those guys love getting up and going on site, you know, fixing, working on the job. But then the front office person is kind of like drinking the Starbucks half the time they're on social media, but not social media to help your business, social yep. media to watch their TikToks, <laughs> you know. And that's where you find the biggest lag, and so really, and they feel like that phone comedy. call coming in is is a bother, and and now exactly. your whole brand impression is based on that hourly person that's a little perturbed. Exactly. No, that's the big. We notice that. Like we always. That's one of, one of the reasons we're like we're going to send you business, but make sure you have that. We'll bring in some coaching training for them, but we also record the calls like a call rail and say, here's what you've been missing. Because a lot of times they just trust the person, but that's. Yeah, really just kind of observing over the shoulder, making sure there's no drop off points. And that's usually it. And that's why the good thing that technology does help with that a little bit, because you can do some automated text and SMS, and that will help make that front office person look better. But that is usually, you want to have that personal touch. And that's why we still encourage to have that personal touch, because people still want to feel, like you said, alluded to, with all the automated messages, but you have a real voice talking, and then it's like, well, they call me when they first say, this is actually a real person, along with the digital that's when you, that's how you're going to win the yes. future. Having that real one-on-one touch along with the digital follow-up and retargeting and messaging, but have that one-on-one touch where customers still feels appreciated and you have a great offer and you could execute on that offer. That's how you're going to win the future. Yeah. A hundred percent. I think that's, that's so important that people really don't think about, they think, Oh, technology and Twilio and blah, 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 all these things that are automated and it's great. Well, it's good, but it should enhance relationship building yep. and it's, sh- you should never hide behind the computer and just hope that that does it. You know, um, I, I, too many times people feel like, oh, I'm selling, you know, I'm social selling, and they're not. They're just liking and commenting and sharing. So you need to have those times where you jump on a live Zoom or you get on a live call or or whatever. So I think that's really huge. Um, let's move over to digital marketing because there's a whole world of, you know, a local marketing for, like you said, you know, HVAC contractors or attorneys or whoever you're working with. Mm-hmm. And it is something that people should realize what's going on, but it's really hard for uh, the CEO or the owner to try to tackle on their own. That's why someone like yourself coming in and setting up these things. Talk a little bit about um, kind of like uh, you hear Facebook changing the you know rules every other second and the algorithm and the, <laughs> all these things. Well, Google does the same thing. <clears throat> and it seems yep. like, you know, hey, I'm, I'm looking good on Google rank today, but next month it's like, what, what happened? Because they changed something. What, what all is going on currently in that realm? Yeah, great question. And the key with it, the algorithms are always going to pivot and change because they know people will figure them out. And eventually there's people that reverse engineer and find a way that kind of hack the system. The key is to do basically what the algorithms want and not try to hack the system. 
provide the best value. For Google, for example, with SEO, and I've studied this for years and years, back in the day, there's so many like scam hacking ways to do it. Like if you were trying to rank for a keyword, you just put the keyword in, a, this is old, very old, like 2009-10, you'd literally have the website and the backs of the website, the language would have the word written in white a hundred times on the page. So I'd say yeah. local top chiropractor, local top chiropractor, and they just fill the page. You'd see the black regular text, but I'm white behind it. And the Google bots would read that and you'd rank for that. And I mean, there was, this is very original old school. Then they came out with Hummingbird. They had Peng- Penguin Panda, Hummingbird, and then Rank Brain. These are different algorithms for Google. Uh, now the, la- the biggest one in the last two years was because Google, it's called Your Money, Your Life, and it was called, uh, the, the name that kind of came was called for medic, for medical, because Google, people trust Google if it ranks high. So they wanted to make sure they crack down. This is the biggest algorithm in the last couple of years, uh, was they wanted to crack down on medical, like if you're a plastic surgeon, dentist, doctors, where they want to make sure whoever's writing the articles, the blog content, your articles, that whoever is is like an authority figure. And then that having good content. So the content is in depth. Don't just put filler content. It's like if you're an expert, you're a local dentist, but like here's the best ways. The longer is usually better, you know, 2,000 above words. But if you could do 800 to 1,200 word article, split it up and actually add value. Like, hey, if you brush your teeth, flush your, you know, here's how you're the best way to, flush, you know, brush your teeth. Here's how you should floss it. Here's how many times you do it. Here's how long you should do it. Here's my credentials. Have your photo, you know, your name, your title in when you upload it into uh, on your blog. Google appreciates that. And having some links out to authority websites, local, like your local news, your local media blogs, or them linking back to you, vice versa, that's what's going to help rank. It's basically the thing with some of these, like people would get really cheap. They would hire a cheap agency that would basically, they didn't do the right content with the authority figure and then didn't provide value. Google wants to, when you rank you really high, they want to make sure that they're providing an article that's, exactly what they're searching for. So if you provide a really good in-depth article, they stay on the page longer, it goes reward it, and then other articles are going to link to it, which gives credibility, and Google says, okay, this is credible. But what people would do is they would get really cheap links, and links is basically getting a, a link from another site saying, hey, this is a site we trust, but they would just get really junky ones. And it's usually like these fiber, you know, everyone's familiar with fiber, but they would get hundreds and hundreds of links because they thought that was the way to do it. You just need a couple high authority, depending if it's just a local business, just high authority links, a couple, one or, one or two per month, you'll be in the top five. If you're good articles, it's not super competitive. Even in major cities, you should be able to rank. And then you just kind of add a, you know, reach out to some bloggers, some other articles and have them link back to you saying a trusted source for that specific keyword, you'll rank. So, and then for Facebook, Facebook always changes their algorithm. But the key with Facebook is just following the rules. They, they want to be a happy place. So for if you're just doing local lead generation for a business, you can't use like fear based, like, hey, if you don't you can't have an offer that scares people. You know, yeah. like it has to be something positive. Uh and back in the day everyone would be like, like, comment, share, and they would the algorithm wasn't smart enough, kinda of like how Google wasn't smart enough first. And then that would be kind of like workaround. You'd say, hey, share for, to win this contest. And then we get all these free shares, which means all more pe- more people to see the offer, to see your marketing, but Google or Facebook looks down upon that now too. So the algorithm got smarter. Yep. Follow the rules, but do just do it in the best interest of your customer. If you do it in the best interest of the customer and provide the best, you know, the best content and do it how the, the algorithms want it and provide the, a friendly environment in Facebook, they will reward you. And that's what this, yep. these algorithms really want. Uh, perfect. Well, Jonathan, let's wrap up with what's the best way that someone that might be interested in having your firm look at their business and see where some opportunities are to polish up and level it up in all of these areas, digital or social or content. What's the best way that someone can reach out and connect with you? Sure. Yeah. My agency is called Revenue Ascend. Just how it sounds, Revenue Ascend. And we have a small little application. We want to find out a little bit more about your company and see where it can help. So when we get on the call with you, we provide some high value, a couple of things. We'll look over your website. We'll kind of see your sales process. We'll find angles. And then we'll, you know, guide you, kind of prescribe you like a doctor. Like, here's a couple of things we recommend. Here's would be the highest value and highest impact for your business. And also what I alluded to in the beginning, making sure you guys can handle it or your business can handle it. So go to revenueascend.com, and that's probably the best way. We have a the website kind of goes in depth in there. And we also have a consulting option, too. So if you're not looking for, like, a retainer, we have one- or two-day services where you have – we kind of usually what people do with the consulting, they want us to look over and making sure that the agency they have in place is doing the, you know, the best interest for them and making sure they're doing a good job. So plus yeah. we also train their staff. 
So if they ever need somebody uh, to kind of take it over, we kind of provide that resource for them as well. So revenuesend.com is my digital agency. Awesome. Well, Jonathan, thanks so much for coming on today. It was really great talking with you. My pleasure. Yeah, it was a great conversation. Thank you. You've been listening to Influential Entrepreneurs with Mike Saunders. To learn more about the resources mentioned on today's show or listen to past episodes, visit www.influentialentrepreneursradio.com.